Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you in the name of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. It is good to be able to be with you tonight using technology. I would much rather be there with you in person, but the requirements are that when somebody has been exposed to someone who has coronavirus, they need to be quarantined. And even though I've been vaccinated, double vaccinated, and even though my tests were negative, I never got one of the breakout cases, which is less than 1% of the people who are double vaccinated anyway. But even though I didn't get a breakout case, I still need to be quarantined. And so, as we have always done throughout this pandemic, we are going to support our elected officials. We're going to pray for them for wisdom. And we're going to follow the guidelines. So, I am here making this recording. I want to say thank you to my teammates. I want to say thank you uh, in no particular order, but I want to say thank you to Sarah Chang for all of her hard work and pulling social media together. I want to say thank you to Marie for getting all the aspects of worship together with the worship servants and um, the changes that are necessary because of this. And I want to say thank you to Nick for being flexible with leading the liturgy tonight and all the things that he does as well. Uh, th- I just want to say thank you to everybody uh, on the team. Thank you for what you do. It's a privilege to be in ministry with you. This weekend, uh, we continue in the Gospel of, of Mark, and <clears throat> um, we're in Mark chapter 7. And you remember, you know, we're in that part of Mark there. We, uh, in the last chapter, in Mark chapter 6, Jesus feeds the 5,000. I think we had a little bit of uh, fun uh, reading about that and the disciples. And Jesus walks on the water, gets them across the other side of the lake. And now it's Mark chapter 7, and, you know, as often as want to happen, the religious leaders uh, try to trip up the ministry uh, by uh, pointing out minor details. That's what uh, fake people often do is major in the minors. When they come to Jesus and confront him about not washing hands, eating with unwashed hands, you know, and all that silliness. And, um, and that's, you know, dealt there with earlier in the chapter. And then we read a little bit about the humanity of Jesus. It's always important to remember the two natures of Christ, truly God, truly man. And so according to his true humanity, he is tired. We read about that here now in Mark chapter 7. He's tired. He'd just like a place to go get some peace and quiet, maybe take a little nap or something. Okay, But he can't even have that happen. He goes into this house hoping to be left alone you know, for a little bit doesn't happen. People find out where he is and uh, a Gentile woman comes to him and uh, wants uh, Jesus to heal her daughter uh, who's um, been uh, possessed with a demon. And so um, we pick that up here in Mark chapter 7. And um, and then Jesus says in Mark chapter 7 verse 27, he says these words that I think, you know, every preacher, when you first hear them, I mean, in every person, when you first hear them, you sort of say, what? What did Jesus just say? Because the woman, uh, this Gentile woman has come to Jesus with this request for her daughter to be healed of a demon. And Jesus responds in um, verse 27, let the children be fed first. Is it not right to take the children's bread? Uh, is, is, it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dog. So one more time, Jesus says to the lady after her request to have her demon-possessed child healed, Jesus responds, let the children be fed first. It is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. I mean, is Jesus just having a bad day? Is he just that tired? Is he snapping? What's, What's going on there? Well, let's talk about this verse a little bit because uh, it definitely uh, needs to be addressed. So first of all, you know, I think, you know, if we're just honest about it, who of us is going to feed their dog before they feed their crying baby? Uh, None of us, right? So let's cut Jesus some slack here, if we will, uh, if that's not asking too much. Let's cut him some slack here in his metaphor. But, you know, I think even beyond that, I, I would submit to you that Mark chapter 7, verse 27 is a, is a Rorschach test, a spiritual 
Rorschach test. You know the Rorschach test, right? That's where you know the psychologist has you look at this blah, this paint, uh, this painting with a blob of paint on it, and then ask you, you know, well, what does that look like to you? And really, what the psychologist wants to hear is, you know, uh, what's on your heart, what's on your mind, right? And uh, and I, I would submit to you that Mark chapter seven is kind of a spiritual Rorschach test. Um, and it's interesting to hear how people evaluate Jesus, because the fact of the matter is, honestly, if you just uh, be a little open minded about it, that Mark chapter seven, verse 27 can be read, can be said uh, with very different tones of voice. Um, you know, Jesus uh, words can be heard as him speaking in a stern tone of voice. Jesus' words can be heard as him speaking in an inviting tone of voice. Look at those words, and now say them to yourself in an inviting tone of voice. Jesus' words, um, Jim Veltz, our, our top Greek prof at the seminary, points out that these words can even be heard in a, in a humorous uh, tone uh, of, of voice. And, and honestly, I would just again submit to you that, you know, um, it may, you know, Mark seven twenty seven may reveal more uh, about you than or myself than it does um, about Jesus. But having said that, you know, what's really the point here? There is something very significant going on in Jesus' words here. There's something very deeply significant, and I want to get to that with you. And then we're going to have a prayer, and I'm going to get into the sermon. Uh, now, to understand what Jesus is getting at here, it's helpful to look at John chapter 1. Let me read it for us. John chapter 1, verses 11 to 12, which says uh, of Jesus, He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed upon his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Now, it's interesting there because in verse 11, it says that he, Jesus came to his own. Now, some might say, well, we're, we're all uh, his own, aren't we? Aren't we all his? Um, and so I think it's important for us to remember that God established a covenant relationship with the Jews. God established a covenant relationship with the Jews, declaring them the apple of his eye. They were supposed to be, according to God's plan and hope, they were supposed to be a nation of priests proclaiming God to the world. Uh, this, of course, we know never happened, uh, unfortunately. And so in Mark 7, where we are today in the reading, in Mark chapter 7, Jesus is doing what we read here, he's coming to his own. Just as it was described in John chapter 1, he came to his own. That's what Jesus is doing in Mark chapter 7. He's coming to his own. Jesus is coming. Why? He's coming because ultimately he's going to establish the new covenant that was prophesied in Jeremiah 31. But the time for that has not yet arrived. And so sort of like the wedding at Cana. Remember the wedding at Cana? They ran out of wine. Yes, it was actual real wine, not just grape juice or non-alcoholic wine. It was actual real wine. And Jesus' mother comes to him and tells him that, hey, we got a problem here. We need more wine. And Jesus says, my time has not yet come, right? But then Jesus is flexible and he provides the wine for the wedding. Right. And so here we see, again, Jesus time for bringing the good news, bringing the covenant has not yet come. He has first come to his own people. Aha. The light bulbs are going on. Isn't that great? He is first to come to his own people. And now here is a Gentile woman who's coming with a request. The time for that has not yet come. But what is Jesus going to do? How is he going to respond? He's going to be flexible, just as he was at the wedding at Cana. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you. We thank you, Father, for so much. We thank you that you are flexible in your relationship with us. We thank you, Father, that... You are flexible because of your love for us. You're flexible because of your desire to restore us into a right relationship with you. Help us, Father, to learn to be less rigid 
and help us to be more flexible towards others, bringing the gospel to people that are new to us. Father, we pray these things in Jesus' name, according to your will and for your glory. And all of God's children, we all say, Amen. So I want to I focus on these words, Mark chapter 7, 24 to 26. From there, Jesus arose and went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know. He's tired, right? He's in Tyre, he's tired. Sorry. Yet he could not be hidden. But immediately, a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard about Jesus and came and fell at his feet. And the woman was a Gentile. And our question, our sermon title is, Can God Be Flexible? There's a lot that can be said about this topic of how flexible can God be? There are chapters written in our doctrinal books on this subject. It was it was good to refresh and, and reread those again. I would just sort of say for you in summary that uh, you know a couple of questions might be in order to help us sort of think through this question of can God be flexible? I think one helpful question maybe to ask ourselves is this. Is God's brain locked into a plan he came up with thousands of years ago? <laughs> In other words, you know, is God, is God in heaven? Uh, Well, I came up with this plan 12,000 years ago. Got no choice. Got to stick to it. I'm locked in. After all, I'm, I'm a robot. (laughs) Is that, does that sound like God? Does that sound like God? I, I would just, you know, another question, you know, to, to ask ourselves about, can God be flexible? I, you know, maybe this would be a good question to ask ourselves. Can God have a new idea? Can, can God have a, you know, he wants us to sing a new song to him. Can he have a new idea or, or is he not entitled to have new ideas? You know, as he looks at how we exercise our free will, is he, is he limited himself and not being able to come up with, with new ideas? Does he have that level of flexibility, do you think? What do you think? You know, another question I, uh, uh, you know, I'd ask you to, to maybe reflect on is, why do some people like like to think about God as being robotic. Why, why is that? What, is that comforting? What, what is, what's at the root of that? What's, what's that really all about? Here's what I would submit to you. Life is not as some grandfather clock that has been wound up and will run out, unfortunately, without the arms so that we don't know. In other words, life is not just on autopilot, not Certainly not from our perspective. Life is not, most certainly not, on autopilot. How do we know that? Because God gave us free will. And with that free will comes a huge amount of personal responsibility. Uh, temporarily, tempor- temporarily uh, in an earthly way, and also uh, in eternal matters as well. I would also submit to you that God absolutely responds to prayer. He absolutely does. And he invites us to pray because he wants to hear what's on our heart. God responds to prayer and prayer is voluntary. Prayer is not something that God forces upon any of us. Uh, Prayer is a voluntary uh, act of a believer, certainly led by the Holy Spirit to do that, but it is still a voluntary act by the believer. And so uh, we, because we are not robots. And so that whole relationship speaks of and describes a relationship which is flexible in many, many ways. At the same time that God is flexible, God is also all-powerful. He performs miracles and he ensures that his ultimate will is accomplished. And so, yes, God is flexible, but not so flexible to the point where his ultimate will is thwarted. God's ultimate will is the establishment of the new creation. And his desire is for uh, all of us to be saved and brought into it. Um, And to achieve that, uh, his son died on the cross to pay for all of our sins. However, as the text indicates, you know, Jesus, Jesus had a will. He had a desire in the text also today. What was his will? What was his desire? To be left alone. So he could get a nap, probably, as I mentioned earlier. Did he get what he wanted? 
No, he didn't get what he wanted. Why didn't he get what he wanted? Because of the free exercise of human will on the part of this mother. And so, you know, here is another example of God in human form. God, omnipotent God, not getting his will. Can God be flexible? Absolutely, God can be flexible. Is God flexible? Absolutely. God demonstrates his flexibility in uh, three ways that I want to draw to your attention now. He demonstrates his flexibility, first of all, by relenting from punishment. These three will start with the letter R. He relents from punishment when he sees a contrite heart or hears a request on another's behalf. It says in Exodus chapter 32 that the Lord relented from the disaster he had spoken of bringing on his people. So God demonstrates his flexibility in when he relents, when he relents from punishment. God demonstrates his flexibility in how he reacts to our fallen condition with his offer of grace. We think of the story, the parable of the prodigal son, right? That there is this, um, this uh person who has uh, turned their back on their father. It's a representation of you and I turning our back on our heavenly father. And the father welcomes us and covers us in his robes of righteousness and prepares a feast for us and proclaims the great news that what was lost has been found. And um, so God reacts to our fallen condition with his work his offer of grace the third way that god demonstrates his flexibility i want to talk about this morning this evening is that god rejoices over every salvation because no one was foreordained nobody was double predestined unto damnation god scripture says that god rejoices he rejoices in the presence of his angels over salvation and i want you to to think about this this rejoicing that God does in heaven when somebody's name is added to the Lamb's book of life, this rejoicing is spontaneous. I mean, it's truly a spontaneous. It's in that moment when somebody is brought to faith that then God rejoices. And, uh, and it's, not, and it's not, just, not only that this rejoicing is spontaneous, so it's, it's dynamic, it's interactive with the salvation of, of individual men and women it's 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 spontaneous uh, it's sincere and it's also spontaneous it's a very sincere rejoicing um you know god's not in heaven saying well you know i knew this person was going to be saved and so now it's time for me to be joyful okay angels everybody be joyful it's time for us to be i already knew it was going to happen this person was going to be saved but now it's time for us to rejoice no no it is a sincere rejoicing and it's a spontaneous rejoicing god also demonstrates his flexibility regarding his means of grace i mean think about baptism for just a minute how we can deliver the goods uh, that god gives to us in baptism we can use immersion martin luther believed that immersion was the better form of baptism than sprinkling um, we can use immersion uh, I, we can use a canteen cup when I was down at Fort Bragg uh, in uh, 2001, um, we had troops getting ready to go over to the Middle East at the very beginning of all this conflict. And I had a lot of baptisms and I baptized people out in front of the World War II barracks using my canteen and um, a public affairs officer videotaped this whole thing. Um, and I've got a copy of that I have to show you sometime. We can, we can certainly uh, use a baptismal font like we do at church. One of the first baptisms I did at Faith Lutheran Church was out in Lake Michigan. And you can see that on the church's Facebook page. God is flexible when it comes to his means of grace, whether it's baptism or communion. And it's, it's a great thing that we can be flexible, that God gives us flexibility in communion. Look at how we've been able to adapt to this pandemic virus, going from how we used to deliver communion to how we now provide communion. We can use a common cup. We can use individual cups. We can use sealed small cups. We can have gluten-free wafers. Um, and then also, finally, just look at uh, absolution, uh, when we forgive one another. Forgiveness can be declared one to another, but from one member to another member, from a marriage partner to a marriage partner, from the minister to the members of the church. God is very, very flexible, very flexible in how he delivers his grace to us. I just want to wrap up the sermon tonight 
by just reminding us again that we have a wonderful mission statement as a church. And our mission statement is simply that we're going to glorify God by spreading the gospel. And we're going to do this by focusing on our preaching, on our teaching, and on living our daily lives. And so let us just wrap up. Let us conclude with this simple thought that the mission imperative that we have been given to go and make disciples of all nations, that this mission imperative requires flexibility and it requires focus. We must be flexible in how we go about sharing the gospel, sharing the good news, even as Jesus was flexible. We also must be focused. We must keep this at the forefront of what we do in ministry and in life. And finally this, when God opens a door for us to share the good news with a Samaritan whom we have never served, let us rejoice. Amen. Amen. Yes, God is flexible. And yes, he enables us to be flexible also, to bring the unbending truth of his grace and mercy to a broken world that so desperately needs it. Let's go in peace. Let's serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good night.